Good evening. Good evening. Uh, nothing rhetorical going on here. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to be here uh, as one of the contributors to uh, Heyday and to the James D. Houston Legacy Fund. Uh, Jim was a dear friend of mine, uh, one of my closest friends, and I miss him. Uh, I still, even though it's been a couple of years since he made his transition, I will reach for the phone sometimes to uh, tell him something. Uh, or to get his take on something and realize that I can't do that any longer. Uh, he was an amazing man. Everything that uh, Malcolm has said about him is true and more. He once uh, interviewed a Zen master in Kyoto, in Japan. And one of the remarkable things about Jim is that he not only was immersed in Western lore, but the lore and the culture in the magnanimous way of all of the Pacific Rim. In fact, uh, he, he has published a book, I think it's out of print now, called uh, Ring of Fire, which is about his, his love affair with the Pacific Rim. And if you can find it or get a used copy, I, I, I promise you, you'll be up two or three nights in a row digesting it. But he uh, interviewed this uh, Zen master in Kyoto, and you know now that there's been this exchange going on for decades uh, between uh, what some people dichotomize as uh, Western wisdom and Western uh, knowledge, rather, and Eastern uh, wisdom, and increasingly, uh, because of our impoverishment, our spiritual impoverishment, we turn to the ancient uh, the Eastern traditions uh, for inspiration and for renewal. At the same time, you can just look at China and see what's happening with the uh, Western knowledge part and the exchange that's going on over there. At any rate, uh, Jim asked this question, posed this question to the Zen master: uh, If two uh, Zen disciples are meditating in a cave, one American, the other Japanese. How would you characterize the difference in their behavior? And he said, the master thought about it. He said, well, what kind of thing do you mean? He said, well, say uh, anything you want to say about how they were basically different, if they are different. He said, well, if you're sitting in a cave and a boulder comes down and knocks a big hole in the cave, he says the uh, Japanese a uh, student will go on meditating and say, well, this is the way, you know, this, is, this was uh, the way of the Tao, and there's nothing I can do about this. So the American would get up and patch up the hole. This is a former times American, I, I would imagine. <laughs> and then go back to meditating. The word in Japanese, uh, Zen, uh, lingo, for beginner's mind, that is a mind that's open to all kinds of possibilities at any given time, is Shoshin. And the class that I'm teaching at uh, CCA, at California College of the Arts in San Francisco this semester, is called Beginner's Mind, in which I'm trying to get my uh, advanced, supposedly, uh, graduate students to be open to that kind of mind, uh, to infinite possibilities. Uh, it was the Zen master Suzuki who said that to the beginner's mind, to the beginning mind, there are infinite possibilities. To the expert, there are only a few. Some years ago, many years ago, when, you, when an oldster like, like me says some years ago, it means a long time ago, <laughs> uh, a grandson of a newly departed uh, friend of mine uh, bewildered his, uh, his grandparents who had asked him what he wanted for Christmas. And he was four years old at the time. His name is Jobin. This all happened in Palo Alto. And Jobin said, I want a Barbie doll. And they were a little bit uh, taken aback. You know, they, they, they weren't from Berkeley. They were, they were <laughs> South Peninsula. And uh, they said, Jobin, what did you say you wanted for Christmas? He said, a Barbie doll. He said, are you sure you want a Barbie? He said, yeah. Can you tell us why? He said, my G.I. Joe is lonely. <laughs> That's beginner's mind. In other words, as Einstein put it another way, that um, uh, knowledge is finite and uh, imagination is infinite. People such as uh, James D. Houston, people such as Al Young, uh, all the wonderful artists uh, whose work has been highlighted, and showcased by uh, Heyday, uh, live in that imagination. They quite often create in solitude, but their work does not take on any significance until you interact with it. Many of us don't have the time to 
take these mysterious journeys into uh, the unnoticed. But the artist has to do that. That's what she or he does routinely. You take looks at things that other people will overlook. And if you paint, you paint about it. If you create music, you compose about it. If you dance, you dance it out. If you write, you write it down. And then it's up to the person who experiences your writing, your dancing, your music, your films, your drama, whatever your art form, to give life to it. In this way, we remain eternally a part of one another. There's nothing that any society can do that's more important than supporting and putting its weight behind the arts, because in the end, the arts will be your savior. Heyday is part of that scene, and you might think it's just heyday. I've learned, I've trained myself not to say heyday books, because you guys did away with that uh, some time ago, in the same way that NPR has done away with National Public Radio. We were saving time. You're saving time. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I can't encourage you enough to uh, think in terms of uh, an investment whose returns are endless. Uh, investing in the arts, and it can be as simple as buying a book or buying a painting or just attending something, uh, is priceless. So that's my message. Stay open. Keep that beginner's mind. Every time you hear a new poem or read a new novel or walk into a gallery and see a new painting or go into a concert hall and hear a new uh, recitation of music, uh, you are back in kindergarten again. You're that little child who is experiencing something for the first time, even if you're 95 years old. Thank you.